Hello, Silver fans. This is T, and you're in the place to be for silver education, acquisition, and entertainment. Hey, thanks for watching, everybody. <laughs> Leor Gantz, thank you so much for joining me once again. Thanks for having me. Well, hey, it's a pleasure to have you on. Uh, you're an expert in the field of global economics, and uh, I have a few questions for you. As a kid and a young adult, all I heard was, uh, we're globalizing and the world is becoming one network and one big happy family and business is going to work seamlessly around the globe. And now I'm hearing about West versus BRICS, deglobalization. And what I really appreciate about you and your perspective is you you reside outside of the United States. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about deglobalization and what you're seeing? Sure. Um, basically, globalization um, really uh, works in cycles of three, four, five decades. Uh, the last big deglobalization uh, period was between 1908 and 1945. And um, that wasn't uh, a good one. Uh, as you know, uh, we had two world wars and a Great Depression within that time span of deglobalization. So those tend to be times when we deglobalize, those tend to be times of uh, more uh, regional wars, more um, regional powers grabbing uh, onto the vacuum left by the global powers that are receding. Um, and therefore, a lot of uh, resets happen on, on, on all sorts of fronts, both economic, uh, political, etc. cetera. Um, then we had a period of globalization, started with the Bretton Woods Agreement, uh, which basically pegged uh, the dollar to, to gold and everything else to the dollar. Um, and then it intensified, actually, uh, and ironically, it intensified in 1971 when Kissinger went to the Saudis and basically um, in order to keep the status of uh, the dollar de facto as, as reserve currency, even though it wasn't pegged to the to gold anymore, it it um, approached the Saudis with a, with a petrodollar deal, now known as the petrodollar, where the Saudis would supply subsidized um, oil or cheap oil to uh, West and its allies, and in return, uh, um, you know, the Navy would patrol the seas and, and make sure that uh, the Saudis uh, have it um, um, have it easy with their original. Uh, um, enemies, etc. The whole overarching plan of that period of 1945 and onwards was for the United States to beat the Soviet Union. And once that was done in 1989 and, and you know 1991 and so forth, um, globalization ended as as a existential need for the West. Wow. Um, but um, there were factions within the deep state and the think tanks in the West, especially in the United States, that said, hey, this has been working out pretty well. Um, we're not just going to say, hey, our arch enemy, our biggest enemy, uh, the one that was fighting us for global dominance is, is uh, out of the picture, so we will stop globalization. No, let's kick it into overdrive because now we don't have anyone stopping us. Uh -huh. And from basically from 1991 onwards, um, I call that hyper-globalization because uh, countries that were never meant to be part of the globalization um, and, and, and its benefits and, and, and uh, drawbacks um, enjoyed it. Uh -huh. and, and so within that period, that's when you go into Iraq and now half of America is like, why are we in Iraq? What's, what's this? Yeah. Because they don't see the vision. Mm -hmm. Because the, who are we doing this against? What have they done? What? Why are we meddling? Then in Afghanistan and onwards and on. So the need for globalization, intuitively, many people felt in America, it's it's no longer necessary. Who who is the the, the country that's uh, that's interrupting us? We, we're we're fighting against nobody. We're just creating wars for our own selves. Obama started it a little bit in in 2011. Um, and, and Trump really kicked it into gear with his UN speech in 2018. Deglobalization really um, became a, I would say, a theme that you cannot reverse 
with the pandemic because here you had a global crisis which ideally would have been dealt in a global fashion right it, it, it would it would have been so uniting for all the countries of the world to come together and find a common solution and how to do this and instead what you saw is finger pointing and in, in many countries and many regions acting very differently towards one thing that was in the middle you had right. a, a virus and then right. you had sweden not doing anything china closing that for two years australia mm -hmm. doing this everyone doing their own thing the globalization and that also deconstructed uh supply chains geopolitics it opened up uh uh, vacuum in the Middle East. Um, uh, you had uh, America pulling out of Afghanistan, and you are now in deglobalization. So, right. um, uh, you know, to, to kind of answer your question, we are entering into this period where America is still the global power, um, but it's taken a role of not sending troops mm -hmm. uh, into other um, regions, and it wants to be. Uh, instead of the uh, the policeman, it wants to be the provider of uh, business. In other words, it wants to sell you weapons, it wants to loan you money, it wants to sell you oil, natural gas, whatever you want, America will supply to you, but we are not sending in the Navy, the troops, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. That part of America largely seemed to be over with the exception that we might see um, uh, American troops in 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 Taiwan, if if uh, that becomes a big deal, and and, and by the way, <clears throat> go to wealthresearchgroup.com forward slash Taiwan uh, if you want to download. It's eighty percent about something called the Malacca Straits. You, you have to know these straits as a trading corridor in the South China Sea. That's where I think the confrontation will start uh, between uh, the West and, and China, and twenty percent about. Uh, Taiwan, which is a more more well researched subject and more people know about, it. but uh, I, I really think it's a must read um, report. Anyways, we yeah, are starting. By the way, I've read your reports and oh, they, they are very thorough and excellent. And I've Thank I have you. noticed what I read there is what I see in mainstream news months later. Okay, okay. I don't know. I don't know if your audience will take it as a compliment, but uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, curve but, is what I'm trying to say. I guess yes. So the BRICS nations, and if you could explain to my audience who the BRICS nations are, yeah. uh, what are the ramifications of them uh, joining together and uh, uh, combining their powers? Yeah. So um, well, the West has NATO, um, and 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 um, there's another organization that's worth um, researching, and it's called the Quad. It's made up of. Uh, uh, India and Japan and America and the United States and Australia and that's actually uh, geared towards China. Um, so uh, Quad, just research that. Very important. Mm -hmm. uh, but the West has NATO. The West has uh, Quad. And um, on the flip side, here you have China uh, growing from the world's poorest country into the second largest economy in the world in, in the span of forty years. But during that time, many things happened in China, and which I want to kind of um, note, and then uh, uh, and then talk about the BRICS. BRICS just stands short for Brazil, Russia, um, uh, India, um, correct, uh, uh, China, and um, and South Africa. So um, now, in, in India, the reason I I kind of pause on India is because it, India is is a very important country that's kind of in the middle of, of both regions, right. both the West and the East. Um, and it stands in, in uh, it, it has very unique traits that make it a key country for the 21st century. Anyways, um, ch so China, um, during this time where it turns its fishing villages and, and its uh, rural population into uh, urban centers, mega factories, um, and, and, and uses the insane amount of, of people that it had mm -hmm. in order to industrialize and uh, become rich in in that process they also mandated a one-child policy which created 336 documented uh, 336 million documented abortions and a culture in which uh, families in the in, in china have one children uh, mm -hmm. still to this day even 
uh, as the, the the policy is is kind of morphed into have three children. The government's incentivized you now to do the opposite. I saw and that. It, it, and it actually gives you, um, it, hey, you want to buy a house? We'll help you. You want one year, two years? How much? Uh, 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 how long do you want the maternity leave to be? You can take it. Um, so uh, the country is reversed, and the reason is that China is shrinking. So uh -huh. China demographically right now has peaked in in uh, um, in productive population, which means basically that this urbanization is over. Mm -hmm. uh, the supply of cheap labor to the world due to globalization, basically to facilitate globalization is over. Mm -hmm. um, and um, uh, about 52 countries in the world, which is a quarter of the world, actually have cheaper uh, production capacity than China. So China is becoming uh, non-competitive as, as a slave labor um, nation, I would say. And uh, out of the 1.4 billion people that live there right now, without any natural disasters, famines, anything else, they are projected to be between 600 and 800 million by the, ta the time the 21st century is over. That's they important. are, yes, it is. And, and, and most people just are not aware of that uh, nearly irreversible trend. Uh, because you can't force people to to have children um you can force them not to but it's very hard to force them to do it um, what are the theories why are uh, chinese people not having children uh well at the rate for, they were previously for 30 years they've watched as the uh as the government did everything to force abortions and mm -hmm. um with with a uh, higher cost of living mm -hmm. um and, and with around 50 million permanent bachelors because there's way more boys than girls uh -huh. it's it's hard to have families oh, um it, it, so you know it, it's a big deal uh -huh. it, and uh it's even worse than in europe in, in europe people just love pets more than uh <laughs> kids so, so so they they have less of them but in china it's even it's just they don't want to and 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 um the, uh, the united states actually um is is doing better now the united states also fixes a lot of its issues with immigration policy so if it has a shortage of labor if it has a shortage people want to come to america talent wants to come to america to to the universities etc china doesn't open its doors mm. to foreigners that so it's it's also hard but they they probably will start changing their policies and accept um other asian um foreigners that, that want to come in but or africans etc it, it it's a whole big issue the uh the point i'm making is that here you have the second largest economy in the world with china um and it's basically cr created uh, uh you know it's not new uh the BRICS countries but russia and china are the major components of this uh, uh alliance because they are really the ones that um, aspire to become global powers. Mm -hmm. uh, India it, it doesn't have that aspiration. Uh, it, it, it's going to be an economic might, uh, and its potential is is unbelievable. Um, but it it doesn't aspire to be an empire. Uh, neither does um, Brazil or South Africa, for that matter. Mm -hmm. um, so, what are literally the ramifications yes. of of BRICS versus the West. So one ramification is that China is uh, going for the jugular and what they're doing is they're the first to uh, kind of enter uh, Africa and at full swing. Africa is the continent com comprised of 54 countries and um, it, it is estimated that the rise of Africa in the 21st century will add about $10 trillion to the global economy, to global GDP. That's a, a, a very big amount. Yes. Um, and, and, and China is the leading um, country there. It's it's not even a question. Mm -hmm. So with, with regards to uh, China looking at where the demographics are going to be the most favorable and going there, they've done that. On the flip side, um, one of the most important frontiers for the next war, the next conflict, uh, the next uh, game changer is uh, lower orbit. And that's where America actually has uh, a very uh, dominant uh, position. So, and if you if you don't understand that there's already a war going on in lower orbit, go to wealthresearchgroup.com forward slash space. 
download that report and read it. It's essential because it, 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 you need to understand what's happening literally right now between China and America. And lower orbit has huge uh, warfare ramifications for, um, you know, what you can do with uh, from lower orbit is is very damaging if you yes. want to damage another country. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and we all heard about hypersonic missiles going out and, and back into uh, the atmosphere. And, and uh, obviously, you can cut out power, satellites, internet, GPS. Okay, you can disrupt the, uh, the entire world from lower orbit. Mm -hmm. um, so we have Africa, we have lower orbit, then we have the dollar. It, uh, the dollar is obviously 60% uh, of global uh, trade, it's the one and only currency used by and large, um, except for a few exceptions. Uh, in oil trade and what China has just done in, uh, a few days ago by brokering the um, the reinstituting of um, of relationships between the arch enemies, Iran and Saudi Arabia, which thanked China openly on purpose, obviously, mm -hmm. um, it is a big deal because if China entered the Middle East, and not only that. But it was able to broker a deal between Saudis, which are a clear U.S. ally for the past 50 years, yes. and Iran, which is a clear arch enemy of the West, then they are an agent, China is an agent of progress and an agent of peace mm -hmm. in the Middle East. And obviously, they're not doing this because they, they, uh, they want to see rainbows in the sky. They have interests that are uh, um, far-reaching. Mm -hmm. One of them is to persuade the Saudis to have a new sugar daddy uh, and to start doing oil deals in Yuan uh, because the Yuan is, um, well, just survey anybody in the West um, or in any leading country if he wants to save his money in Yuan or in dollars, and you'll probably hear that 99% say we rather have it in the dollar. Right. So the, the Yuan is, has a lot uh, of catching up to do in terms of standards, and rule of law and, and, and everything that makes you know the, the the dollar perceived to be the uh, risk-free cash asset. So by doing this, by entering the Middle East, it tells the United States, "Hey, we've arrived. We're here." Right. It tells the entire world that tells that to the European Union, etc. Um, and and it this is what I'm talking about. This is the this is the deglobalization that's happening. So the BRICS. Uh, Essentially, um, th they want to end the hegemony that uh, the United States has had uh, on the rest of the world uh, for the past 50 years and, and start to uh, influence uh, wherever they can, which means obviously the Middle East, Africa, Latin America, uh, uh, the United States, I'm, I'm sorry, Europe, and uh, to a degree Australia. So that's where this kind of a clash is happening. Now, the United States... Um, the last three presidents have uh, seen that globalization is no longer that necessary for the United States to facilitate and, and keep its global advantages. Um, Mexico has become far more important to the United States than China as right. a trading, as a manufacturing partner and trading partner. Mexico is far cheaper than China. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's just, you know, it's it's a border away. It's easier logistically, etc. You have that. Uh, secondly, the United States is built um, for trade. The Mississippi River, mm -hmm. with its extensions, is the most efficient trading um, highway in the world. Uh, mm -hmm. As as you know, moving anything by uh, water compared to land or air is about uh, eighty percent cheaper. Right. So you, you know the United States has within domestically, anything that it would ever need to uh, remain an empire. And mm -hmm. I think that uh, what you're seeing is basically you're seeing the, uh, the United States looking more and more within and say, hey, we have the oil reserves, we have the natural gas reserves, we have the manufacturing capacity, we have the brain power. We can afford to stop uh, being the policemen of the world and uh, to to move back and, uh, and and see what happens um, in order to fix our fiscal imbalances, our national debt, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and that's what I think is, is clearly uh, happening right now. Um, what 
this will lead to, and nobody knows. But uh, as you can see, it's already creating a lot of inflation because you, you have to essentially take things that were already made and done, mm -hmm. factories, supply chains, all that, and relocate them or, or create them anew. It's almost like you have a, a fully furnished apartment mm -hmm. and, and you tell yourself, I don't really like these furnitures. I'll just buy new ones. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, you can do that, but obviously it's a big expense. So right. that's what's happening uh, essentially. And, and, and I don't think it's over. Yeah. Um, in the next two, three, four years, you will continue to see high inflation in America. And as you know, CPI is grossly understating what's really happening um, in the economy. Yes, I agree. And I'll tell you what, uh, fascinating times we're living in. And, uh, you know, as you mentioned earlier, uh, I encourage my viewers to check out your reports uh, to see, uh, you know, Lior's perspective and, uh, you know, things that you might not find other places uh, to, to, to learn about what's really going on in the world. So, Lior, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate your time. Absolutely. Um, one thing I did want to tell you is for your uh, viewers, uh -huh. if they want to access my entire portfolio, yeah. excluding anything commodities, uh, they can go to wealthresearchgroup.com forward slash portfolio. And that's literally uh, my entire portfolio. And that will be down in the uh, video description for people to find. Thank Thanks, Lior. Absolutely.